VCT Lock-In was undeniably the greatest Valorant tournament to date. We started out with 32 teams in a single elimination gauntlet, and as the matches played out, we got to see storylines from across the world come together and be redefined in real time. The arena was electric, and with every moment mattering, the tension was as high as it's ever been. Teams were desperate to prove they'd made the right moves in the offseason, but only one could finish on top. Whoever won would have a long journey filled with high pressure moments, and would have to change every narrative along the way. This is the story of that team, and how they won VCT Lock-In. Coming into 2023 and the start of Valorant franchising, Fnatic wanted to make changes to push for a trophy. Their 2022 squad was good, but didn't quite have enough firepower to challenge at the very top of international tournaments. And looking at the roster, there wasn't much debate on who they'd replace. Boaster had been on Fnatic since the beginning, IGLing the team to their only Grand Finals appearance against Sentinels in Reykjavik 2021. He gave the team a level of fun and personality, and a Fnatic without Boaster wouldn't really feel like Fnatic, so he stayed. Another obvious keep was Durka, the star duelist and consistently top performing player for the team. He clearly had the talent to become one of the best in the world, and at some point in 2021, he probably was. And the final player Fnatic decided to keep for this year was Alfie, a Turkish wonder kid who was scouted by Mini in mid-2022. Ever since an incredible ace on raise in his first match, he put up great performances on a multitude of roles, so it only made sense to keep him for franchising. Mystic and Enzo played well for Fnatic, but were the weaker links on the team and where it could be improved without a complete restructure. They were dropped, which left two slots open to make this team a European powerhouse. And so they did. The first new addition was Leo, former player of Guild and a clear standout on that roster. His initiates play was already formidable, being regarded as the best Sova in Europe by many, but with a top level team around him, his level of play could rise even higher. Speaking of incredible initiated players, Chronicle was next to be added to the roster. A trophy winning, hyper flexible, experienced player with two grand finals already under his belt, he would bring the squad from great to a genuine super team. And there you had it, the European super team that clearly had the potential to be the best in the world. But could they actually do it? A few months later, and it was time to find out. VCT Lock-In was the first tournament in the Valorant franchising era, with all 32 franchise teams in attendance. But with so many teams, only one format was possible, a single elimination bracket where if you lost, you were out. No second chances. Not only that, but the bracket was completely randomly seeded, as there was no previous data to base any type of seeding on. So for some teams, they'd play a slightly weaker opponent in the first round, and for others, they'd play a team touted to win the tournament. Fnatic ended up with the latter, as they'd be playing against another stacked team who happened to be one of the crowd favourites, Sentinels. But before we get into the matches, I do have to give a shout out to the sponsor for today's video, Surfshark VPN. If you're watching this video, I'm sure you already know what a VPN is, and I don't need to explain all the benefits of one, like encrypting your internet activity so nobody else can see it, getting notified if your personal data has been leaked, blocking all ads, watching content that would normally be region locked, and even saving money by getting first time offers on websites that you visit frequently. Maybe you knew all of those, maybe you didn't, but there's a unique way to use VPNs in terms of Valorant that you probably don't know. You see, Riot accounts are region locks. If I make an account in the UK, it's stuck in that UK time zone for servers and updates. But by changing my server location in Surfshark to the US, I can make a new account there and get updates earlier than I would in the UK, like access to Gecko. Or maybe you're fed up of people throwing your ranked games and want to experience the serenity of Pacific ranked lobbies. Just change your location and you're good to go. There's no guarantee that the ping will be low, but with Surfshark, there's no limiting of bandwidth like with your regular internet connection, so you can ensure it will be as fast as possible. All of this for just £2.8 a month, literally one Valorant knife skin a year. Which is more worth it, complete internet security or the smite knife? That one's up to you. And with that, let's get back to it. Out of every match in the first round of games, this was universally seen as the best and most exciting. On one side, you had the super team of Fnatic looking to prove themselves, and on the other, the clout giants of Sentinels. And when Sentinels are playing, you can guarantee a boatload of viewers. But there was another factor that gave this match even more tension, something less obvious than the sheer caliber of the rosters. For Fnatic, it was an opportunity for revenge. The last time they had played Sentinels was in the grand finals of Masters Reykjavik, the closest the team had ever come to a trophy. They got swiftly thrown in that series, leaving them brokenhearted and without a grand finals appearance since. Despite winning that series, Sentinels hadn't done much on the international stage since then either, so both teams were looking to assert their dominance by defeating an old foe. 
As promised, hundreds of thousands of people watched on to see how these two super teams would match up at lock-in, but it wasn't the close game many were expecting. It's on death to try and make something happen here. No pressure anywhere else, and Dirk has walked down mid. To Dirk it. Already getting some lovely damage down onto them, and right through the wall, it's three kills in the round for Dirk. What a way to set things up, and nobody dropping on the side of Fnatic. That's a prime gaming flawless. And then over to Pankhada, he's got his ultimate, so he's going to be able to get a free plant now onto A. 1v3. Can he do it? He's got a lot of time to threaten a reposition. He's going to smoke both... I quite Spawn like this. and a link. It's really smart. He's just the throwing fanatic. a bunch of misinformation into it. But this fight now by Leo him meeting him into short. It's Moving massive. The first kill. It's massive. Takes it down to a one v two. But he's given away where he is. What is that? Chronicle so far ahead of his teammate. There's no trade in sight from Alfie. Another paranoia. Waiting for the tap of the spike. And there it is. Rips his way across a full blind. Another tap from Alfie, but still biting, waiting. Smoke ready and waiting. Wide swings it, but Alfie. So calm and patient in the clutch. Ends up to do. Paranoia rips his way across, including the stun as well. Finding a one fight. No! All just being met pound for pound, match for match. The crossfire just far too potent from Fnatic. Fnatic ran away with Haven, going up 9 3 at the half, but the curse wasn't active this time as Sentinels lost the map 13 6. It was much the same story on Split, where Sentinels decided to put Tens on Sage, an agent he had literally never played before in competitive play. He's actually played well in this series, but the x -Set guys really struggled to adapt to Fnatic's precision plays, which reflected in their stats. The second map went Fnatic's way 13-7, and they had gotten their revenge. Sentinels were sent home after the first round, and Fnatic had a solid game under their belt where the new additions and mainstays alike looked really good. Confidence was building within the team, but the closer they got to the trophy, the more the pressure would ramp up. And that's where the danger lies for Fnatic. You see, Fnatic had somewhat of a reputation in international tournaments for choking. Every time the pressure got a bit too much, it seemed like the team were lost in what to do, not playing to their proper individual levels. Take Masters Copenhagen. Fnatic lost to FPX to finish fourth, which is a respectable result, but when you realise they'd beaten them four times in a row previously, you start to wonder why they couldn't when it mattered most. And at Champions Istanbul, where the Turkish crowd were fully behind Alfier and Fnatic, they couldn't even make it to the top four that time, losing 2-0 to Xset and 2-1 to a rejuvenated DRX. It always seemed like it could be Fnatic's time, but just never turned out that way. That's why so many people doubted Fnatic coming into lock-in especially. This was probably their most pressured tournament environment yet. If they couldn't do it in a double limb format, why would they be able to handle the pressure of a single limb gauntlet like the one here? But it wasn't just the format that would pile on the pressure. There was also the crowd. Lock-in was held in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and if we know anything about Brazilian crowds, it's that they really, really care about Brazilian teams. The passion shown by Brazilian crowds in any sporting competition is almost unmatched, and it was no different at Lock-in. We got to see the crowd out in full force for Loud in the Alpha bracket, but Fnatic would have to face another Brazilian team in their second round match in the Omega bracket, the new and improved Furia. The atmosphere in the building for this game was electric, and it was clear to see why. Fnatic were coming in as the favourites, but Furia were not to be underestimated. Fnatic knew that all too well, considering they were only a few rounds away from getting eliminated by them in the group stage of champions only a few months ago. Obviously Fnatic had made upgrades since then, but they weren't alone. Furia had also made upgrades, signing MW Zera, one of the most promising Brazilian players and someone who, if he had the crowd behind him, could completely change the course of this game. With his help and a great performance from Starblade Digizin, they'd managed to take down the Korean giants of T1 in the first round. Could they pull off the upset with an entire country behind them? Like, Fnatic wanting to go aggressive straight into B. Durka trying to inject some pace into the opening of this map. Only a fake though. Spike headed towards Garage. They're droning it through. Durka has a chance to flank though. QCK is not aware. Yes, he is. <laughs> he's at least aware enough to take care of Alphier. He's in so much trouble, man. Yeah, he's in so much trouble. Every single kill will get this crowd louder and louder as Chronicle 48 HP. And that's all it's going to be. First round, Furia. The turret will spot him, but he's isolated right now. This Seeker is coming at him as well. Oh. Hey, don't wait for it. Uh oh. Oh, Leo. Quiet for now. That turret just got information. Nobody really close. Oh, MWZ are not able to find anything to this man. But Zine playing backside. He's but <laughs> two and he isn't able to get any. The scoreline was familiar for Fnatic at the half, going up 8-3. But Furia wouldn't be put down without a fight. 
a long, long fight. Oh, and the Bucera, he's got a lot there. He's flashed, he gets the ball! The Molly is out. The sacrificial lamb. Oh! No a shot, point. the Molly's, it's a 1v1. We all think there's a second one coming, there's not. Oh! The what? tying up from QCK, he does have another Molly! Not a lot of time left. I don't know that Leo can find a way in. So well played by Furia. So well played by QCK. Slightly different Viper wall. Viper's pit is going to be up. If they get on site, they have not considered this. On the mini-map, there's the reckoning that you mentioned. Mazin not, not checked! Mazin not checked! He gets two. Three rifles left on the side of Fnatic, however. And they've got two people ready to play post -point. Khalil might even have lineups for Mollies. And there's a playing all the way down long. And he takes Scare Durka. TCK keeping the pin up. Overtime on the cards! <laughs>and after that incredible 18-16 win on Haven, Fnatic seemed to show that they could hold on when the pressure built up. They did rely on huge individual performances from Durka, Leo and Chronicle, but they're some of the best individual players in the world, why wouldn't you? The second map of Ascent was slightly more straightforward, with Fnatic taking it 13-9 and the series 2-0. Furious showed great promise, but Fnatic managed to shut them down, something they might not have been able to do at this point in 2022. It was a good win for their momentum, and they'd need it for the next game, against the team that many thought were NA's best. 100 Thieves were cited as possibly the best North American team coming into lock-in. They'd added one of the best oppers in the world to an already great roster, and every player on the team had the potential to pop off in important moments. An impressive win at Red Bull home ground in the off-season solidified this community perception further. Could they do the same in Sao Paulo? Their first two matches weren't exactly promising. They'd won them both, but went the distance against Edward Gaming and Foot, two teams who were touted as some of the weakest coming in. I mean, at 12-10 against EDG on map 3, it genuinely seemed like 100 Thieves were going out of the tournament. They hung on though, making it to the top 8 in this match against Fnatic. Considering the ways both teams had made it here, with Fnatic going undefeated in maps so far, looking calm and collected, and 100 Thieves looking frantic and relying on clutch plays to barely make it, Fnatic were definitely the favourite coming in, but an upset wouldn't be a huge surprise. And don't forget, this was another revenge match. Champions 2022 had seen Fnatic play 100 Thieves twice in their group, knocking them out the second time, so 100 Thieves had something to prove. Only time could tell in this battle of EMEA versus NA, and oh boy, did it. Fnatic were ravenous. They absolutely dissected 100 Thieves on the first map of Fracture 13-1, and Icebox wasn't much different. 100 Thieves made an attempt at a comeback after a 2-10 first half, but couldn't complete it, and Fnatic moved on 2-0. This match seemed like a statement for the boys in orange, highlighting just how much better they were than the top teams from the other regions, particularly one that had been hyped up to no end before the tournament had even begun. Once again, Durka and Leo looked so, so good. Durka's performance maybe could have been expected, but Leo had only ever been to one international event prior to this. At 19 years old, he was putting up MVP performances in front of packed crowds in an incredibly high pressure environment. After this 100 Thieves game, Leo had not died first in any round Fnatic played at the tournament. 
Not a single first death to his name after six entire maps. That is simply ridiculous. But it wasn't just Leo, all of Fnatic were on fire. They'd made it to the top four of Locken, beating three high caliber teams on the way there. Their next opponents though would be a familiar foe, and the team that denied them higher than fourth place in 2022, FPX. Well, Na'Vi actually, but with four of the same players before and adding CNED, it would be a storied matchup. Copenhagen saw Fnatic fall to FPX in the lower semis, despite having a four game win streak against them prior to the match. If Fnatic lost to them again here, those same feelings of regret would arise. With the team composed of so many cracked individuals, would they be able to take down the synergy of five other cracked players on the other side? Durka vs CNED, Alfie vs Sagetsu, Leo vs Shao, Chronicle vs Zipan, and finally Boaster, could he compete with Angel, someone he dreamed of playing against? On the biggest stage, did he belong alongside the top IGLs of Valorant? The match began, and it was time to find out. This was the semi-final, so it was a best of five instead of a best of three like we'd seen previously in the tournament. Fnatic banned Pearl and Na'Vi took away Durka's Kingdom of Icebox. That left us with Haven, Lotus, Fracture, Split and Ascent, a veto that seemed to favour Fnatic. Could they finally conquer the curse of Copenhagen? Yeah, it's gonna be on Alfier, depending on which way he decides to go. The rest of the members of Fnatic are on the side. Durka down in hell, bringing CNET down with them. Still staying alive, still healthy for now as Boaster joins in on the fun. The spam through the box as Angel falls. Shao left in this 1v4. And he's being surrounded, he's being outnumbered as he's being gunned down. Durka with three and we're tied at two apiece. Leo is close by, the shock dart's there, but Boaster gets a kill right beforehand. Boaster with the second as well. Three pistols remaining on the side of Navi, make that two. And what can Sugetsu do? Nothing. What a clean round out from Fnatic. I know he is. This would be an outrageous shot from Cena, but he's not even going to get a chance to shoot it off. The kill goes in favor of Alfier. The spike goes down for Durka. And now a 4v3 with nothing but pistols on the defensive side. Positioning not great. The spam through from Durka cleans up to. And the only win condition here would have been Shao to have a smoke on the spike. Yeah. Gosh. Back into B, though. They weren't considering this. The fact that they could still pivot Alarm Bot. Maybe it'll take down Alpha. The fact that they've still gotten this far is outrageous. He gets, he gets one with utility. CNET on the tap. 49 HP. He still has the op in hand and he goes aggressive. What a shot out from CNET. But Fnatic find oh, what they need. Fnatic find what they need. Shot left in this 1v3. Surrounded. Smoke buying some time, but no. Dirk on the spam. Fnatic take Haven. I mentioned Leo as a key factor in the 100 Thieves game, but this was the match that cemented him as a contender for the best player in the world, and 100% the best Sova. He dominated Na'Vi on Ascent, and the momentum gained there carried Fnatic through to take both Lotus 13-4 and Fracture 13-11. Na'Vi of course looked super competitive, but Fnatic seemed to be on a different level. Fnatic were the best team in EMEA, but more importantly, they'd made it, back to a grand final. Not only had they made it back there, but this time they were the ones who hadn't lost a map, mirroring Sentinel's run that crushed their dreams all the way back in 2021. If they could do the same as Sentinels and win the Grand Final 3-0, it really would show just how good they were compared to the rest of the world. The only problem? It'd have to be against the world champions. Well, the former world champions. Loud had come into 2023 with two changes that were almost forced onto them. Sassy and Pancada were poached by Sentinels after the team won champions, which led to the signings of Kawantine and Tuis. They were both young players who'd been prodigies in the Brazilian eye for a while, and players who Sadak and Frod believed they could mould to Sassy and Pancada's level. It proved to be a winning strategy, as Loud took down every team in their way to make it to the grand final. That included one of the best series of Valorant ever played against NRG, and avoiding a reverse sweep in the semis against DRX, so Fnatic weren't the only team who'd proved they could cope under the pressure. And you could even make the argument that Loud were under the most pressure of any team at the event. The crowd wanted them to win so, so badly, and they didn't want to let them down. A Furia crowd is one thing, but a Loud crowd is another. Riot even opened more seats at the arena specifically when Loud were playing. They knew the demand to watch them was so high. For Fnatic, that meant a grand finals with a packed, passionate crowd rooting against them from minute one. And they made that very clear. For Loud, on the other hand... Yeah. 
and as millions of eyes watched from around the world, the grand final of VCT lock-in began. We started with Ascent, a map that Loud had a 20 and 1 record on. They had literally only ever lost it to Optic in the grand finals of Masters Reykjavik, since which they'd beaten them twice on it at Champions. Loud were on their home map, in their home country, with a crowd behind them all the way. It was all Loud, at least that was until the map started. And you're gonna see Fnatic in general on this map go for set retakes. They don't like to flood in as the plant is going down. They like to be very structured, make sure there's nobody tree, clear out anybody that could be backstabbing. And they're going to realize here that all five players are towards Sight and A-Main. So peace of mind towards Cat. Knife against it, flash up the top, can't detonate it though, suppressed. Fragment Nade gonna be clearing a part of that one and now here comes the waterfall right down and out. Fragment Nade finds it and a fight's being taken. Fnatic laying claim to the map. Then claim to the site, it's all down to this. Less with the most to do, trying to spam it and boast the starting things up. Man's gonna need a security detail with attempts like that. Try and take that market position. Loud wondering what's going on, and Leo goes for it. Okay, Hunter's Fury up close, and a flash play! What is that? Fnatic cooking up plays out of nowhere. And here we go. Anything but patient. It's fast, it's rapid. They want to take control of this one. Stun onto Poster. Where is he TP into? Cuts across the angle. There's a smoke in his way, and they are none the wiser loud. Getting silenced here. A tap of the spike. Rotates around. It's a little bit awkward, but guess what? It's a triple for Poster. Durka. All reliable. And two at the end. That's the cherry on top. Fnatic looks so good. The Fnatic turning the arena into a library, but loud have got to do the most now to try and upset that. Knives in Aspas's hand, what is the Q he's waiting for? Dashing to the side, spots a player, pings it out. One kill found, still got the knives. An upgrade Less in the weapon. Less has cleared out B main as well. But it's a 2v3, make it a 1v3. Aspas just nigh impossible to keep them in the map. On their favoured stationary ground, still held down. And that 13th round is claimed, Fnatic off to a fantastic lead. Leo again dominated Ascent with his patient, disciplined play. Fnatic shut down Aspas in every way possible, causing him to go double negative, which is not normal for a player like him. Fracture was much of the same, with Leo absolutely dominating, only a few bullets away from clutching this 1v5. All of that damage done while Aspas was up a drop, literally 1 oh HP. My. A single bullet. At 2-0 up, Fnatic looked primed to finally win the trophy they were destined for, in undefeated fashion no less. But Loud would not be swept aside. As good as Fnatic were, Loud would push themselves to be better. If I see Leo on a site at this point, I am running the other direction. You're leaving. Nice enough time though, Slow was there, now you see it. What is the play being made? Rocket the showstopper. Zero damage. Against nothing, and Leo just couldn't quite dodge the flash still. The execute continues. Loud looking to try and pincer this one. Poster is under assault from so many different angles. The counter spam, the punish. It's there. By bullying Two E's and Fnatic. Uh, sorry, Two E's and Sadak on the A side. They did defeat. Slow war. Paul Ducker. Left, right, and center. The man's just fighting off swarms of the utility. Cute wall play as well for Leo to get an angle, but nobody bites. Contact, they know. Alfie is there, Les strikes back! And will he get the fourth? Yes, indeed! A hard reclearance, but the spike was planted in the middle of all of this one. Loud. Starting to squeeze, you've got to find these kills. Look at the push. The B main players from Fnatic are wrapping all the way around. There's all flanks the around. on flanks. A pincer play, a pincer maneuver. On top, on the angle, and that's fast. He watches for it. Two remain, make it one. Straight into C, Sadak has to be the man. The man of the hour, Prowler latches on still, but again, Fnatic, they waited out. This is such a strange move. Fnatic, under time pressure again. They're grasping. They wanted to get back into C, knowing that there was no Nano Swarms there, and now they have to re-hit 25 seconds. It's so uncertain, but a skip and a hop over and away! Shut down, spray down, it's all sad hack. Angle watch for. Pure reflexes, pure precision! And the ace is denied, but I think he's okay with it. 
Dash said, what do you do? What do Fnatic do once they first get hit? Once that first punch lands, do Fnatic have what it takes to be able to rally back? At the moment, Loud are swinging. Pure desperation. Two players fall, containment, flick to the side, Aspas. Might be good for two. Jiggle in the movement, everything to play for. And every player falling. Wow, do it! It wasn't Aspas that put up the game-winning performances though, rather another player from that champion's winning roster, Less. His sentinel play on Split and Lotus was that of a demon. Throughout the maps, the noise built in the arena, paralleled by the momentum built in the server. If Loud could carry it into the final map of Icebox, we'd get the first reverse sweep in Valorant history. All the way back on B, he's going to be that last final piece of the puzzle, but a spike denied, there's no time left. Good 12 Spam. seconds. Spike in her hands, and it is Aspas who has to do the most, and he does. Distraction in the play, and the pieces get picked up. The round gets salvaged with the spike down. It's a post blind. Chronicle move forwards. Can't quite take the fight and win it. Alpha has still got a chance here. Sadak and Les are very weak. Does the lockdown get invested? It yes, does. it does. Huge investment from Sadak. Alpha, he's got it. Sticking. Nothing afforded. No time. Half under the fuse. You've got to be kidding. So this one, what's the call to be made? Loud, they push forwards, they push deep. Cope used, blocks up one of the angles, one of the avenues, and boast, uh, or I should say, Chronicle. Almost going down, Dark going wide, maybe that panic again, settling in. An extension to the round, though, as time goes their way. Fnatic, though, danger. returning fire! Major danger here, the pistols. Lighting these players up, Reckoning has to be pulled out, has to be used to contain, has to be used to shut down, and it's all slam dunk! A safe plant and an ult online, Kawazin has the Seekers, and it's time to let them loose. Corralling, finding their targets, pushing forwards, Kawazin, nothing left unsaid, nothing left untold! And it's just a collapse! Inexorable is the feeling, loud with a 9-3 lead! 9-3, a scoreline that we've seen so, so many times before. Usually the team with 9 rounds closes it out, but this video isn't about how loud were the first two-time international champions, or how they made the first reverse sweep in Valorant. It's about Fnatic. It's about a team who could bring themselves back from the brink, even when it seemed impossible. But they were destined for it. Right. Boys, this is it. I want to hear, I, want, I just want to hear some comms, okay? Like, I feel like our comms have just disappeared, okay? Like, if we just play like it's crap, just communicate like it's crap, I feel like we got a shot in this still, okay? Focus for this scrim, for this half of the scrim, is communication, okay? Let's win this pistol, and I'll carry us with the IGL in on this attack. Let's go, okay, let's boys? go Alpha. If we don't win the pistol, let's go, guys. I will try and carry Smoke. with the right. IGL. Yeah. yeah, come up, cool. let's go, let's go! History looks firmly on the side of Loud, and a tragic tale is being weaved. This Fnatic, so close yet so far. It's been 643 days since they had that last chance in a grand final to lift a trophy. They've been to five global lands since then. 68 matches. Oh. Everything is in favor of Loud to pull off our first BO5 reverse sweep in VCT history. Less overwhelmed though, as Boaster responds. That creates that 4v4. It's up to Fnatic not to drop the ball now. Spike gonna be planted, down over the top, relieving it still, Sadak. Lucky to escape. Snake at his feet, Kawazin with the heel. Still a wall in their face. Now two years coming through. Cascade breaks it up, flash play, Boaster fully blinded with every shot rattle. It feels like the nail in the coffin. Kills found, bodies fall. Alfie and Leo, they've been amazing. They've been immaculate. But this might just be too much. Aspas, three in the round, sticking the spike. Pistol is theirs. I said it before, I'll say it again. They've only ever lost to two squads. And it does not look like Fnatic are going to join that elite group. 
on the eve of the 2023 season, Loud look to have ripped it from their hands. Possibly paved their way brick by brick. Just giving a hop across and just guesses incorrectly. So. Trying to reset the aim, wide swing. They are going to pull off the impossible. It has to be one round at a time. on the spike as pass. Jet force, it's all down to Alfie here. Noise everywhere, double swing! Spray down! Unbelievable! And a groan of absolute disbelief from everybody in the building. I've been Commend, and thanks for watching.